Willa was so compelling. She was able to draw out the best of people. And I think what enabled her to do that was how much she loved to talk and how curious she was. She had a, a voracious curiosity. Marvelous capacity to listen. Fun-loving, interested in many things, but also no nonsense. There was just a little bit of awe that she inspired in the end. She was an enabler and a catalyst. What fun it was to work with Willa because she was open to anything. So by the sophomore year, I was a coach, which was unheard of. And by the junior year, I was the head coach for his <laughs> class. And sometimes I could give the lecture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Would you remember his name? Paul S. Smith. Okay. Uh, and once he told me, he said, you're the best student I've ever had except for one. And that was Richard Nixon. <gasps> oh my <laughs> gosh! And they had all the citizenship teachers they needed, but they said, could I teach English? And I said, well, I speak English. <laughs> I don't know if I can teach it. <laughs> and so I start at the end of my first year at Mills, the second year as I started my life at Cal here. Uh -huh. I had this beginning job teaching English for foreign born in night school. Oh. And I, I did that for years and years mm -hmm. and years. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had the most delightful students and I got to be a very good teacher. They used to shift me around so that if a class was losing its uh, students, didn't have enough students mm -hmm. to continue, they'd changed me and put me in there, uh -huh. and then it had built up, wow. so I, and I wrote a lot of the material. In, oh, in the first years, we were right down in the front of the Doe Library. When you come in the main entrance, uh -huh. and the first door was uh, to the left. There was a room there, quite a large room, and we shared that with the sign maker. Oh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and since it was the first office and door, when you come in the library, everyone who came in the library stopped in mm -hmm. to see where, where they, they should go. Exactly. And also, then, what is this? What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of lost time, but mm -hmm. uh, chatting with folks who came by. Mm -hmm. We also were only could only work a half day okay. because the air was so bad in this room. Oh. There was no ventilation or mm -hmm. no, that nobody was allowed to work more than half a day. Wow. Our famous Rojo luncheon meetings with Willa holding court. Um, usually a lot of food on the table because we always ate our lunches while it went on. It was a very casual but a very um, informational meeting because we all reported on the progress of our uh, of our respective projects and um, people were in the know of what everybody was, else was doing and able to make comments, suggestions about um, the course of the projects involved. She would often just throw out ideas, and I was the recipient of some great ideas. I remember one day in the office, I heard her call, Does anybody like Jack London? And I said, I do. And so I got to interview Milo Shepard, who had inherited the, uh, the Beauty Ranch mm -hmm. up in the uh, Valley of the Moon. And that was wonderful for me. It was a family history that I never dreamed of working on. 
sit down at her desk that looked like a, a, a sea. I mean, it was tides ran through that desk. And she, she read everything that came out from all sorts of organizations and kept abreast of everything that was happening in the university. And she would point out that there was a lecture one should go to, or that there was, oh, I noticed someone made a donation, why don't you follow up on that? And, and, and we'd talk about history. And, and those were some of the most memorable times I've had of just listening to that mind work. <laughs> and, uh, how alive she was. But we did a suffragist series. We did it, and we were rescued by Rockefeller Foundation. Uh -huh. But it was at the last minute, and Cheetah had already, without pay or anything, gone and interviewed Alice Paul, because Alice mm -hmm. Paul was dying. Mm -hmm. And she knew it was now or never, and she, mm -hmm. couldn't, she couldn't bear to have Alice Paul die without an oral history. Mm-hmm. And then Maka did Jeanette Rankin, and we just saw a play last week that was based on that. That's right, history. yes. Uh -huh. Kurt Herbert Adler, San Francisco Opera Project. Mm -hmm. This was a very ambitious project. Willa wanted not only 50 hours with Kurt Herbert Adler, who was the director of the opera company, but she wanted divas. Kurt, uh, she wanted Luciano Pavarotti and Beverly Sills and and Leontine Price, and she also wanted the backstage people, wig makers and lighting designers and union chiefs. So the result is a, is a in interesting and unique bird's eye view of opera production from inside. The reason Cheetah knew Newton Drury, she had been assigned she, when she first came in to, she was working on the University of History of uh, the history of the University of mm -hmm. California, and one of the men she interviewed was an engineer for the university. Uh, and so she finished that interview. He said, "You really ought to talk to my neighbor." Oh, um, <laughs> really? And so he took Cheetah over to the house next door to meet Newton Drury. Oh, is that right? And, f and from that brief yes. meeting came everything that we did with national parks yes. and uh, the forest forestry, area. and mm -hmm. even through Newton Drury, we met mm -hmm. Earl Warren. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a regular interview. Um, we had been working on Earl Warren for some years, years. The project, the Earl Warren project was already going forward and we were interviewing persons from his uh, administration as governor. It was a, to document him as governor of California. Um, Earl Warren had made it a condition of <coughs> okaying the project to that he would not talk about the Supreme Court. He was then Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he felt that was privileged material. But it made a big book, and people said how interesting that was, of course. and how dull his autobiography was. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Which shows why oral history is sometimes uh -huh. more fun, more spontaneous, yeah. and that a very well contained, a man who only gave judicial opinions, like Earl Warren, could be very stuffy when he wrote his autobiography and mm -hmm. very fun when he was just speaking. And he, she said, I found this, there's an architect who did this beautiful house, and here's all his papers, and I think we should document her. Mm. And it was Julia Morgan, whom <laughs> hardly anybody would heard of. I mean, they'd heard of her, of yeah. course, but she was not famous. Hmm. And so we had to, Dr. Hart called me in, and I said, mm -hmm. oh, Julia Morgan's dead, Dr. Hart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we, we thought about it, and this I have to give Suzanne Reese great mm -hmm. credit. She, we thought, what can we do with this? And we looked at the papers and it and we could get the names of people who had worked with Julia Morgan. Oh. We put together mm -hmm. Suzanne put together a project with all uh. kinds of people who'd been related to mm -hmm. Julia Morgan and Mrs. McCorkle 
managed to get the university to put up the money to oh. for the Julia M Morgan project. Hmm. And from then on, we really moved into a lot of mm. architectural uh -huh. things. But uh, it was also the rise of the fame mm. of Julia yes. Morgan. But what was interesting about all this is, is Willa maintained the steadfast interest in a subject that she really, I don't think, knew terribly much about, but she had this sort of instant insight that it was something worthwhile. At the time, there was very little literature. Back in 1982, what literature there was would fill half a shelf, and now it's, it's burgeoned to the subject of disability studies and universities. And, uh, she knew it, she just recognized it, and that was, that was phenomenal. The first section was what had gone on in Berkeley, because Berkeley was a center, a big center for the, the rise of the independent living movement and the disability rights. And um, as of, and then the second section was uh, the broader uh, independent living movement across the country in Boston, New York, Texas, Chicago. And so now the collection is, is a substantial research platform of, um, uh, I think, more than 10,000 pages of uh, transcribed pages. I realized, with Sue Gangwear's assistance, that mining was a major, major profession in California and that we were not documenting anything about it. So we. I had been thinking about it for a while, so when you came in, it was like a little little trip from heaven that somebody had sent me one means. So when you start a project, one of the first things is you've got to have somebody to do the project who knows about the field and could do the interviewing and could also know people to raise money because I believe by that time we were practically totally supported by outside donations. But you have to have an interviewer who knows the subject well enough from studying or working in it or something to be able to interview the people. And you have to have somebody who can develop the series. You have to know who are the important persons in mining and what are the real issues we need to develop? Marvelous capacity to listen and to think very practically mm -hmm. and deeply about how a project should be organized from the get-go. And I mean every aspect of it. Um, she particularly um, was helpful with the financing because she was quite willing to, after we had schemed a bit about who the likely sources could be to tap, she was quite willing to, to write letters and, and pick up the phone and whatever was necessary to get a, a project off the ground. In very much a Willa manner, a project that began with a smaller mandate expanded as time went on. I was always impressed with how interested she was in going out mm -hmm. to receptions and gatherings and the opera and theater and some of this I even went, eventually went with her to these things. But I, I think she, she had an enormous number of contacts. She had a huge network. Yeah, I think she did a great job with, I mean, she, she really did have wonderful connections in the community. Well, I was noticing, I would notice that when she would come back from the opera or the play or whatever, she always scanned the list of donors to the organization yes. that appeared in the program, <laughs> thinking That's of right. them as potential, possibly, I for must, Rojo. Uh, yeah, I must say that I always thought it was wonderful that she would go to a gathering and ask people for money. It was something I really didn't ever feel comfortable doing, but I... I was in awe of her that she could do it, and she succeeded. Willa was always, always out. I don't know how she did it, mm -hmm. but as long as I knew Willa, she she would come to anything in the city, which had to be a stretch for her. Right. And uh, just to meet meet a sponsor or 
go to a presentation. The presentations I thought were wonderful, didn't you? Yeah. Where Willa always had these marvelous remarks to make and, and always knew so many people. So I felt was terribly significant to me about oral history was how much the people who were interviewed mm -hmm. appreciated yes. being documented and uh, their families appreciated it and their colleagues appreciated it. Mm -hmm. And so it was a sort of a do-gooder do job. You, could, <laughs> you were happy that mm -hmm. you had made that many yes. people happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the presentations were a way of also people were very honored yes. to have the presentation. And what's more, they were usually at the end of their life, mm. or very often at the end of their life. And uh, their friends and family would come to this event yes. to honor them. So mm -hmm. just as in Dr. Loudermilk, when people yes. came from mm -hmm. around the world to honor mm -hmm. him, mm -hmm. and, and he knew it. Yes. And that was a wonderful feeling. Mm -hmm. I think if I had to use a term for Willa, it would be a catalyst. Because just as she did in the Disability Rights Project and the Sierra Project, she could recognize a good idea and then go about strategizing on how to make it happen. And As long as it took. Right, as long as it took, but also pulling in people who cared and who knew something about the project area and then letting them go to it. And when they would get, uh, when any one of us would get kind of discouraged, which of course we always did, periodically, you'd get discouraged, there was no money or the interview you were working on didn't seem worthy. She wouldn't put up with any of that. Oh, Anne, come on. <laughs> And, and always thought that, you know, keep working at it and something's going to come with this because it's a good idea. It still stands out. Her office stands out in my mind as being the singular office on the campus that was so harmonious. What, what kind of feeling do you have about the whole Rojo process and what, what you had done just by looking at these entries in the catalog, so does that give you a feeling of pride? Oh yes, and I think, I look at these marvelous people we interviewed, uh -huh. I mean, and, and how, mm -hmm. what an opportunity for mm -hmm. anybody to have these people pass before their eyes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is what was so exciting uh, and interesting.